So I'm, I'm Michael, I'm part of the CKI team which runs the kernel CI pipelines internal to Red Hat. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about incident management. This is something that as we run a service is very important for our, the user experience. Right? Like our customers are kernel developers and they tend to be grumpy. So we try to kind of like keep the quality of the service high enough. So um, to just give, give a bit more detail on the background. So we are a service team which runs pipelines. This was not something we understood in the beginning. So in the beginning we thought we developed the CI system. Um, it took us quite a while to actually understand that we are mainly running it. So, um, but the point of the system it, itself is that we want to prevent kernels from hitting the internal Red Hat composers. Um, but we also try to shift testing as far left as possible. So moving to integrate into the upstream kernel development workflow, providing feedback on patches on mailing lists. Um, so whatever that means, right? And integrating into the upstream kernel development workflow is fun. Um, and we're also running, because we are a service, quite a bit of infrastructure to make this all happen. So we are running a main GitLab pipeline. So nowadays kernel developers sit on gitlab.com and they have a merge request and it's all kind of like normal. Um, so they get pipelines and green check marks and all those kind of things. Um, and we also hand testing off to beta. In addition to this, we run all kinds of microservices. Um, we run stuff in EC2, in Lambda. Um, we use OpenStack. Um, we host our own messaging cluster. Um, so there's quite a, quite a bit of infrastructure that runs and obviously is also able to fail. Um, so if you want to know more, um, I've linked the homepage. Uh, the code is on gitlab.com. Um, you can take a look what this actually means. Um, but yeah. So normally, on a normal day, we run this pipeline, we run our microservices, and we deploy quite some changes in there, right? Like because we run a service, we change it, uh, product owners come along, have some requirements that need to be done real fast, and then, so basically there's some churn, and that's also the possibility to actually break this thing. Um, so, um, what is actually meant by an incident management? So, if you would define an incident, or the internet helps us um, as saying that an incident it's an event that will disrupt the service. That's easy, basically it doesn't work anymore. But also that will reduce the quality of the service. So that means pipelines might take longer. Um, sometimes it fails, sometimes it works. Uh, people have to click buttons instead of stuff going automatic. Um, and incident management means then what we do in response to them, how we can mitigate them so that they will not be as um, visible anymore, and how we can resolve them. Um, and in the best case, um, we might actually do something uh, to prevent them from happening again in, in a similar way. And now this is about small service teams. And the, way, the reason I put that in there is that if you have a, a huge organization, you might have some dedicated teams that do this incident management for you. You might have really dedicated roles, dedicated uh, site reliability engineers that, that take care of, of running it and handling this incident and recovering. But for these small teams, that's mostly just the same people that actually also develop the service. So um, I will do, do the talk in two parts. One is um, how to detect incidents. Um, and the second part will be about how you actually recover from them after you've detected them. Right? So yeah, uh, why do you actually want to detect incidents? Right? Um, it's not per se necessary to detect incidents. Your users will normally tell you, right? It's a bit cynical, but it's okay-ish in some way. Um, if this is good enough, if your users are maybe not um, as grumpy or they, they, they don't rely on it too much, they might actually tell you, right? Um, eventually, you should notice the biggest problems that, that your service has. But if you want to know before, or if you want to be able to detect the things that are not as obvious, um, you need to do some work. And that normally comes uh, in the form of a monitoring and alerting setup. Um, and so this is the, the first part of the talk. It's um, trying to detect these things as early as possible so that it is a relaxing thing to fix them because if your users haven't noticed yet, maybe they are still awake, right? Like an international team, 
uh, you're sitting in China or in, uh, in Europe and your customers are uh, US based, you have a couple of hours to fix them. So if you notice before them, you might just fix it before they ever actually see that something was broken. And now depending on how you build this thing, whatever you are running, it might actually mean that a lot of different pieces might fail in a lot of different ways. And that makes the thing also as complicated as it is. And the normal components of such a setup is basically you try to log, so you can check what went wrong last night. Uh, you have metrics so that you can basically measure how long something takes so that you actually have some numbers. You can create some pretty graphs. Um, not only for management, but also for yourself to debug stuff. Um, you can use uh, something to collect exceptions if your code fails somewhere deep in the stack. Sometimes, it's really hard to see this in any aggregate measures. Um, so surfacing these exceptions uh, is one part of it. And then alerting means getting a pager alert at night, getting emails, uh, having a Slack channel, those kind of things. And to actually make this happen, because talking to different teams, teams on board to some of these things, to, to others not. It makes sense to think of it in a way that it's really easy to onboard whatever you are developing in the future. Because normally, stuff just aggregates, you get another microservice, another cron job somewhere. So finding ways to actually make this very systematic so that you don't have to do any work to add another of these pieces uh, will actually make sure that the people are actually on board to these things. And so I, I will go through the uh, pieces a bit. I'm not sure how many people are actually familiar with this stack. Could you see maybe who knows at least one of those? Okay. Two? Still? Okay. Three? Uh, okay, that's good. Four? Okay, a bit less. And how many do I have? Five? Okay, that's interesting. And which part, for the ones that didn't raise their hand at five, which part is missing? Like, which part do you don't, which part do you not we know? We don't have exception. Like you don't have sentry? Uh, but we know what it is. You know what it is, yeah. Okay. How okay. And, and for others, what, what piece do you, <laughs> what piece are you missing in, in your <laughs> setup? Like, which, which, which is the un most unknown one of the list? Anybody wants to say? Tra yeah, tracing is missing, but like from this list, is there anything you're not doing in your own service if you run a service, or which one is the un most unknown? Which one? But like, if, if you now take this list of these five services, which one of those do you know the least from all of these? They all know? Okay. Now let's just go over them real quick. Let's, let's start with logging. So um, there's, there, there are a lot of, lots of ways to aggregate logs. Um, the easy one to set up is Loki. Um, it's basically yeah, an HTTP endpoint, you send it logs. Um, there's a client tool called Promptail, which pushes them, which is interesting and which makes this thing pretty resource constrained, is that it's not going to index your logs, it's just storing them in the three buckets, depending on how you configure it. But the point is that you index the labels that you put on them. So you might put the service name on them, but there will be no indexing. So if you're actually going to look for something, you will basically download all the logs during a certain interval from the S3 bucket and then go through them locally. And that makes this thing pretty, pretty simple in some way because there's no, uh, no in index database that needs to be kept. It's, basically, it's really just an S3 bucket, right? Like it's basically blob start downloading them. Um, and pieces you want to put in there is if you run Kubernetes uh, log files um, from pods, um, if you have cron jobs, need to figure out a way to, um, you can tee into them, the standard output. If you run nodes, the journal is kind of nice, but this is, for example, one of the pieces we miss. But if you want to know what happened on this node before it went down, kind of interesting. And if you run stuff on AWS, any of the uh, hyperscalers, then actually getting the logs from these systems in there as well um, is also kind of nice. And so one other thing next to just being able to debug this, uh, these incidents, one other thing that, that logs give you 
uh, at least here for Loki, but I think also for other systems, that you can actually alert based on what is in them. So some weird issues you might only be able to find by some message locked somewhere. And so um, Loki allows you to actually say like, oh, this message is in there, uh, complain or send an email or something like that. Um, and yeah, one way of, of applying these things, if you run Kubernetes, is trying to figure out how you can put this into whatever you use for Kubernetes, YAML, templating, customize, Helm, whatever. So that basically it becomes really easy to, to onboard the next microservice here. Um, Promises is for metrics. Um, why do you need metrics? They allow you to measure stuff, stuff that's not obvious, like duration, the number of jobs, those kind of things. Um, it's basically a time series collection system that puts labels on stuff. And it just takes a text file from a metrics endpoint. So this thing is as simple as it comes. That's the reason why it's so popular. Um, there are very few data types. You can have counters that only can go up. So these things can cope with restarts because then the counters start again at zero. So it's possible to unwrap these curves. So that works very nicely in a Kubernetes context. Um, you have gorgeous, whatever, how you, however you pronounce it actually. Um, they will vary, so it could be, um, I don't know, something that you measure continuously. Uh, there are histograms if you want to care, if you care about distribution. So that's, that's basically it. And onboarding this thing is pretty easy. So one, you can in Kubernetes scrape all pods. It takes a bit of, of uh, configuration to do that, but after you've said that, you deploy a pod and it will be scraped. And exposing that in something like Python is all of four lines. So it's importing the package, defining the metric, um, doing something to the metric, and starting the HTTP server. This thing will start up with HTTP server, you put it into your pod description or like deployment description in the service definition, and then you can curl it, and it gives you what's shown at the bottom. So it's basically, here in this case, um, it's, um, it's a counter. This is basically it, right? Like this is all there is to it. This number will get ingested and Prometheus will hit this endpoint again and again in a certain interval and this will build your time series over time. Um, and then you can make graphs, right? Like that's, that's, that's why you do it, right? Um, but even if you don't have graphs, right? Like you, you can create these rules at the top. Um, in the beginning it's weird, even after a while it's weird, but it gets easier slightly, right? Like so there, there are ways of aggregating across different pods, different instances, um, linking stuff together. So this, is, this has a very powerful query language. Um, and you can define the alerts based on these rules as well. Now, for the exception handling, that's an interesting one because normally if you have code deployed and you don't handle exceptions, the normal case, what you try to do is kind of like do something, lock, a, lock something, go on, um, which is the right thing to do because you don't want to have your service go down just because there was a small problem. But that kind of like gets these weird things lost. So Sentry is a system that basically hooks into your code. It can hook in web frontends, Python, Golang. I, I'm pretty sure there's an SDK for, for nearly all programming languages available. I'm not sure about Bash. but um, and you, you can see these things develop. Um, Sentry will collect these um, and aggregate them. The only thing in Python is one line of code starting this thing up and configuring it. Um, and it will collect all the information, yeah, a lot of information that should make it easier to debug um, the problem you had. So in this case, for example, it shows one of our things and at the top, so you see a list of, of exceptions that happen during um, during the service, right? Like it's not stable. Um, and then you get these little graphs that show you how often this happens. Uh, here in this case, the last 24 hours, there's something consistently wrong with the thing. Um, and it shows you, um, yeah, the message of the exception. Now if you would click through, you get the stack trace, you get the variables of the stack frame, you get um, HTTP access that you had before. Um, so normally that's good enough. Um, the most important feature is that you can assign them to somebody, right? Like um, you can fi find somebody in your team that needs to care and then you can just assign them to them and then hopefully they will care. And the last piece is alerting. So if you find any issues, um, especially around um, Prometheus, you have some metrics, some SLAs, uh, whatever your service level agreement is, you need to at the end 
alert depending on the severity. So one thing is you can send emails, but you also can send stuff to a pager. So, and then this is what it look, looks like, right? Like there's, there's a web interface to it as well. So you can basically go there, you can silence these alerts. So after you've basically got it and you have find, found somebody to handle it, then you can silence it so that it will not spam out. So this is kind of like a pretty normal alerting stack, um, uh, monitoring stack, but yeah, okay, now you know, right? Um, the, the next problem becomes is like, what do you do actually, right? Like, so um, you, you kind of like found issues in your code, and now, right? Like, um, now if you tell this to an engineer, normally what you get is basically this, um, and that's eventually for sure what you should do, right? Um, but yeah, the, the point is a bit like, what exactly do you want to fix, right? Um, so there are both technical and social components to, to handling incidents. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be having this talk here. Um, so one thing is that you want to fix the immediate problem, right? Like if, if it breaks your customer, you want to unbreak them as fast as possible. You also want to fix it properly, most likely, right? Like something that needs to happen in, in a certain place. Um, to kind of like do a real solution, not just somebody uh, logging into some machine and changing a config file, those kind of things. And if you're really good, you will actually find the root cause, um, improve on the problem that was actually causing the incident in the first place, and do something to it so that it will never reoccur. Now the social problem is, who does these things, and do you actually do all of them? Um, and yeah, as I said, right, like if you're a small service team, there are no people dedicated to the to this handling process. Uh, it's a team responsibility, which normally means nobody does it, unless somebody is kind of inclined to like doing these kind of things. And normally, or what, I've, what I know from our own team, from, from other teams in our proximity, um, the person to fix that is basically the senior engineer that knows how the system fits together. So that's, that's basically the one that knows exactly what to do, will do something real fast, um, might also do a proper fix. But if this person is on PTO, um, you're kind of a bit out of luck. It's really hard to learn from this person as well because basically the person does it, right? Like there's no visibility into it. And then, depending on how you stable your service up is, it might actually mean that this person actually could burn out from having this on their shoulders basically because it's the only thing. Yeah, so, so the question is, um, does this process include uh, how um, the work is spread in the team, if I understood correct? Dispatch. Dispatch. But if the issue occurs, are the worst technician fits the bug, or what somebody has transferred? Yeah, so, so is it sent to, so, is somebody just picking it up, or is it actually dis, uh, delegated to somebody? Now normally, in these small teams that I've seen at Red Hat, for example, is that basically there are a couple of people hanging out a chat channel, an alert comes in, and then there's somebody caring, <laughs> and they pick it up. Um, it's not, I, that's, that's the bad example, right? Like there's another one coming, right? Um, but this is, this is something that, that I've seen happening and which, which actually works and is, is very often the case if there's no formal process around incident management, right? So yeah, you shouldn't do that, right? Like maybe I should have put this on the slide. So next version I will put something on the slide, like don't do that, right? Like this is, works, but not recommended, right? Um, so yeah, um, th that's that's something uh, we figured, and so we thought like actually how to how to come to a better process because uh, having this in place um, will hopefully uh, reduce all these disadvantages on the previous slide. Now, if I say something about process, people get all blurry in their eyes, right? Like this is not something that people or engineers enjoy too much, like talking about a process and it all feels like bureaucracy and complicated and management and those kind of things. Um, so we created, we tried to come up with something really simple um, that would actually be something that engineers do instead of just something that's on some website. But yes, the first thing you have to do is create a ticket, right? Like it, it is that bad. Um, it's it's pretty easy actually to create tickets um, on most uh, Git forges, so you can press a shortcut. But this is the first thing you have to do, and also one of the main building blocks is that if something fails, create a ticket. So um, if you ignore the rest of the slides, um, this is one thing. 
because otherwise you will not have a conversation about the incident and there will be no place to learn for any team members. There's also no place to delegate. So if you want to kind of hand it off to somebody, you need a ticket. Um, you can post screenshots in there. Most Git forges allow you to have confidential comments if it's a public tracker, which is really highly recommended. And then do it in a structured way. So that's the most advanced figure that's going to be in the slide. Um, so these are the cases. So normally you have an active incident, something is broken, some, something exploded. And the first thing that people normally do and should do is try to reduce the impact, to give you some breathing space. Uh, you will figure something out, right? Like normally people have some idea what's going on. And this, this can be the most senior person in the room doing something real quick, right? Like that's, that is quite acceptable. And you will get to this place where it's called mitigated, which means that somehow your customers might not know that much anymore. Um, and then you can work on solving it properly. So it might be you're using GitOps, you need to do something, you need to change some Python code, go through review cycles, all those kind of things. Um, do it properly, right? Like this would be the second step. But normally there is this first step where you kind of like get it fixed real quick. Uh, maybe it shouldn't be that way, but it's being realistic, that's mostly what happens. If you get to this place, the ticket can be resolved. Uh, and now comes the interesting part, right? Like because just because you resolved your incident doesn't mean you're done. Uh, so the last part that mostly gets ignored and why we designed this process in the first place is that there's more work to do next to resolving the incident. And that's mostly improving on the root cause. So there was something that caused the incident, not just that it would actually explode it, but that it was possible to explode in this way in the first place. Sorry? Could you read? Do you mean problem or change ticket as aftermath of the incident? For, yeah, that's, that's the thing, right? Like, there are stuff, teams that basically create a new ticket, and then it gets put in the backlog, and then it might disappear in the backlog. Um, but the recommendation is to not do this, but actually keep your incident open as long in this resolved state. That's what we do. Um, until you actually prevented the reoccurrence of the incident because otherwise you accept the fact that it will happen again, right? Like this is basically what it is. If you're not improving on the root cause, you accept that it will happen again. And now we give an example of something that happened three weeks ago. Um, spot instances got more expensive on AWS. They increased in price. They hit the on-demand uh, limits, uh, on-demand prices. And the tooling we use is Docker Machine. Uh, you need to give it a limit, like a price limit for how much you want to pay for the spot instances. Um, you need to configure this because the tool requires it. It has a default that's kind of weird. So you need to set a default and uh, set a limit. Our limit was too low. So we didn't get any spot instances. Yeah? So that's, that's always beautiful, right? Like GitLab jobs did not run anymore. Mm. Okay. So the first fix was to secure shell into the GitLab runner. Um, to change this variable in the config file, right? Like that's, that works, right? That's just like vim, regular expression, replace all, boom, it, they spawn again, right? That, that, that is going from active to mitigated. The second stage was to configure it properly in whatever GitOps solution you do. Um, in our case, it's a deployment repository, pipelines, reviews, configuring it properly, it deploys. It's still open, so if you click on the link, I created the ticket this morning, not three weeks ago, so that tells you something about how much we stick to the process. Um, what is still open about it is actually that the <coughs> Docker machine should not require you to specify this limit, because this comes from a time when AWS was actually bidding. Nowadays, spot instances are not done with this bidding. They have a price. You take them or you leave them. Um, they are also limited by the on-demand price. So the, fi the root cause fix that this will never happen again is basically remove all these limits that you have in your configuration. And now, for the last minute, five minutes, something, I will ask you about something. I don't know how good you, how many of you are Red Hatters, um, how many of you read email lists. Um, you have enough mailing lists internally. But anyway, so there was um, an in, a site in some company um, where secure shell certificates were renewed. Um, and before these, the uh, uh, SSS certificates, and before that, the SSS certificate was issued by an external uh, CA. Uh, and the renewal was done 
but the CA used was an internal one. So basically any customer needs to have these internal CA configured in their system to connect to this site. And so this is basically what happened. Um, it broke all the customers that uh, internally needed, needed to connect to this site. Um, and it surfaced on a mailing list. Uh, this is just a hypothetical example. Right? Um, and now, um, I don't know, um, the game is um, what would you think, what would be the fix uh, or what would be the actions you would take as a team going from an active state where basically somebody complains on the mailing list to closing the incident ticket. So that's, that's the interactive part of the presentation. Yeah. Okay, so the answer is secure shell into uh, the machine uh, and use certbot. Um, I can tell you it doesn't work because it was a service that's not secure shell accessible. <laughs> Next one. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the answer is to, to roll back to the old certificates. And that, that was exactly what was done. Uh, they were rolled back. Um, because they were renewed, but the old one was still valid. Um, they were from the public CA, so it would restore access. And so doing this would mitigate the incident, right? Um, customers are now able to, again, connect to your service. It's mitigated because if you don't do anything else, it will break when the certificates expire, right? There was a reason for the renewal. So what would be the next step that people would need to do? So, so the answer is uh, use the right CA and create new certificates. Did I understand that correctly? Right? No? If you're talking about CA, can you provide the CA to audience? That would be one way, yeah. You could pre provide the internal CA to all customers, yes. I don't have to that, right? Yeah. So, Yes, that, that, that would be one way to resolve the incident, find, track, or, track down our customers and give them the internal CA. Uh, what happened in this case actually is that they rolled new certificates with the public CA, right? Like because they could do it the first time around, so here it was actually done the second time. Um, so basically renew it correctly. Um, so that would move it to resolved. Um, now what would you need to do to actually close the incident ticket? So that it will never happen again? Policy. What do you? Policy. Policy? Right, policy related to this. So the answer is to, to write a policy so that they that people do it correctly. Okay, what, what else could you do? Why automate? Automate? Yeah. Yes. Write automation that these these certificates automatically renewed so nobody needs to touch it. Um, yeah, that would be second part. Um, what else would need to be done? What else went wrong? Monitor the domain. So yeah. If it ever happens again, we know it as much possible. Yeah. So, so the an the answers uh, mo at monitoring because here they only found it after the users complained on the mail. So there are like three steps that you need to do after you resolve the incident to actually close it. So, yeah. And so th that's basically all there is to the. So these are the answers, right? Um, so this is all there is to the, to the whole process. Um, if you take anything away from this talk, that is that if you resolved an incident, it's not yet closed. There's work to be done. And if you don't do this work, if you move it to another ticket and put it in a backlog, you accept the fact that it will happen again. And like there, there is, there's a social aspect to the whole thing. Um, and you need to account for this. So if you have phases, there are phases defined, they make sense. They are necessary, you shouldn't skip them. If you have phases, you can delegate them to other people, right? Like so the senior person can respond and you can handle it. So there's learning involved. You can track them, but make sure that you don't drop these issues uh, from your view because otherwise next year when these certificates come up again, you might make the same mistake. Um, and yeah, this thing actually works. So the, the process, um, so it's something that where we have a Kanban board, um, and yeah, we move these issues along. Yeah, and 
Now, if you, t if you tell us that there are a lot of active incidents, yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, um, it is totally worth thinking about these processes, defining something, and trying to, to surface them and track them over time. Right, like this, this is what one of those tickets we have. It's, a, it's basically an example. Um, you see, it's, there's still stuff outstanding. It's, it's a resolved ticket, but it still needs work. And it's still very annoying to have this on this board. Um, so that's, that's kind of the point, right? Like, it should annoy you. The process should be not, uh, it should make things visible. OK, so that's it. Um, do you have any questions? So the, the question is, how did we convince people that it's important? Um, so we, we, we have a, uh, something called request for comments. So there was a process agreed. Now, and I think in this case, we didn't write it down, but it basically was a problem. So we, we, had, we had the problem that these incidents needed to be handled, and we, we needed to involve the team. Because one of the things that comes up here is that if you, as a senior engineer, just fix this stuff, you will not fix it as good as if you talk to people in your team. So that was one of the reasons that basically we tried to, to implement this, that it becomes visible. Yeah. Did we convince all of them in the beginning? No. Are they now convinced? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so the question is, do we have SLAs or SLIs for actually, um, yeah, an SLI, like, like an indicator of how we are doing related to these incidents? Uh, no, you could create one out of these tickets. Um, so for us, the main thing was that they would actually be visible and that there wouldn't be too many tickets in this resolved column. So this has happened, but yeah, it's, as you see in, in this case, so we switched to this project a couple months ago, you have a lot of tickets in the active column. These are kind of like weird issues that sometimes happen that are hard to track down. Um, yeah, so no, we haven't done that. That would be the next thing to do. But just having an SLI never really gets the work done as well, right? Like it's, it's, it's this agreement of a team to work on it that is more important than having a number symbolizing it. Yeah, yeah, it would be, would be, so the, so the, uh, the question is, yeah, uh, using an SLI would actually allow you to, to figure out how you're doing over time. Yeah, I totally agree. Would be nice to see this. I would be too sure what would come out of it, right? So. Also, do incident tickets have any assigned priority? Or like everything yeah. just comes in one single pool? So, the, so the, the question is, do, uh, is there a priority to incidents? There's no pr uh, priority between incidents, so incidents are all labeled very similarly. Um, the priority in some way comes out of this, where they are on, on the board. Um, yeah, yeah so, so it's related to SLA, right? Like, what do you agree on? Yeah, but, but normally incidents are things that should not happen, right? Like, it's. I'm, I, I forgot the quote, but somebody said, like, if you, if you don't handle the incidents correctly, you are basically breaking the promise to your customers that you're caring about their experience. Because they, they tell you or something breaks, and you're not making sure that it will not happen again. Which means that whatever you do instead, you consider more important than whatever broke their workflow. So that's kind of like, now obviously, as you see on our incident board, it's, there's still things in there. So it's... But, but this, this, this is what it comes down to. Yes, yeah, so what we do. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, the question is do we, have, do we have any knowledge base to, to prevent reoccurrence? So we have something, an operations manual, where we put instructions on how to fix things. But the focus is really on preventing these things from happening again in a structural way, most, most of the times there's something you can do to prevent it. Some architectural thing, something you 
I don't know, you need to change two pieces instead of one, right? Like, and then sometimes you forget to change this other piece and then it explodes, right? Like, that's an architectural thing. So moving to one, one source of the configuration so that it basically gets used in both places would be the fix. So if I understood correctly, there's a, there's a Grafana stack that can be used to kind of like link incidents together and yes. link them uh, to. Because monitoring helps to do this in Grafana stack. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.